Tirupati from JNCSR, a minimal synthetic model of confluent epithelia. All right, good afternoon, uh, and thank the Academy for the invitation, the opportunity to present my work here. Um, I do have to start with a confession. Uh, until a few years ago, uh, until two years ago, I didn't know anything about confluent epithelia. Uh, the focus of my lab is to basically look at dense, disordered systems, and uh, there were a whole bunch of studies that started coming out in uh, which they started thinking about confluent epithelia and tissues as uh, disordered packings of cells. And uh, then we started, decided to look at these systems. And what I'm going to try and convince you today is the need for a synthetic model. So if you're willing to look at it, this picture with loving eyes, then I would like to convince you that this is going to mimic some aspects of confluent epithelia. And uh, that's what my story is about as to why we have to do it. Uh, so let me begin with a, a movie. Um, so by the way, when I say jamming, uh, if you're from Bangalore, you're definitely not thinking of a music session with friends, right? Uh, so you're definitely thinking about traffic. And uh, so what I want to show you is a movie of jamming of uh, bronchial epithelial cells. Uh, so bronchial epithelial cells are the ones that uh, uh, line your airways. And uh, what you're looking at here is, uh, let me play the movie. And uh, so these are uh, movie, these are videos from different days of maturation of the cell. So this is day six, day 10, and day 14. And uh, this is a confluent monolayer, and that's going to be key. By confluent, what I mean is there are no gaps between cells, there are no white spaces. It's a very dense packing of cells, all right? And uh, if you were to see this movie, what you would see is that it's quite mobile here, whereas it kind of is jammed here. All right, and uh, what I can of course do is to just plot, I can track the center of mass of every cell uh, and I can get the displacement maps. And if I were to do that, what you of course see is this sort of a displacement map that's kind of pronounced here. And in the jam state, all cells are basically held in place. It's completely uh, locked, in, uh, locked in place. And of course, one thing that I do want to uh, highlight is that the motion of these cells is highly cooperative. Right? And you can imagine that in a jam packing. If you're going to move, you're going to displace a whole bunch of cells around you, uh, be it in a crowd or be it in a traffic jam. So the same thing happens. But the key thing is that this jamming transition is completely independent of density. Right? Because I started with a packing that's completely confluent, no white spaces. I end with a packing that's completely confluent, no white spaces, and yet the system jammed. Right, and uh, this is very different from the jamming that you and I experience every day. Okay, um, and uh, that's not just true for traffic and people; it's also true for atoms, grains, colloids, and uh, all sorts of molecules. All right, and this transition, of course, is density driven. Right now, the question becomes: What's driving this one? All right, and uh, uh, so. Uh, I'm going to basically rush through this model, uh, but basically the model has got to do so. If you were to look at the top view of this cell packing, it looks like polygonal tilings of a plane, right? So the model that you have is called the vertex model, in which every cell in the monolayer is basically a polygonal tiling, and you have some sort of an energy function associated with it. So you basically have cells that don't fluctuate much in height, which means you have something associated with the area elasticity. It's quadratic, like you see here. Uh, there is an addition between cells, so you have something that's got to do with the line tension. So if the cells like to adhere a lot, they're going to prefer uh, a long vertices, right? And if they don't like each other a lot, they're going to prefer shorter vertices and be more circular. And of course, uh, there is this actomyosin cortex around inside, just within the cell membrane, and that's going to give you some sort of a stiffness. So, and once again, you associate that with a spring. Now, what people found in this model is that you can non-dimensionalize this model and all of that. And what you find in this model, um, I don't know if this color is coming out back there, but what you find is that now you can define for every cell a shape index. And the shape index is just basically the cell perimeter by the square root of the cell area. It's something to do with the shape of the cell itself. right? And what this model predicted is that if this quantity called the shape index is less than 3.81, you get into these sort of jam states in which cells are held in place. And if this perimeter is greater than 3.81, sorry, the shape index is greater than 3.81, which also means that the cell shape is more elongated, you basically are going to get fluid-like packings, right? But the key thing here is this is a completely confluent monolayer, even in the model, which means fluidization is being driven by changes in the cell shape. All right? And um, the video that I showed you, those authors basically looked at 
uh, the shape index of these cells. And what they actually found in their study was that as the maturation was happening, uh, the basically it started out from a value that's greater than 3.81, which was the fluid-like state that I started with. And then as time progresses, it basically approaches 3.81 and gets more jammed. All right. And of course, the interesting feature of the study is that if you had uh, healthy cells and asthmatic cells, then you have very, very different uh, uh, time scales over which these things jam up. All right. Um, now, if you were to look at this error bars of this distribution, you would ask me, why the hell should I believe any of this? Right. Now, uh, and uh, the question is that, so I'm also plotting for you the, uh, the probability distribution of the shape index, because the shape index that's being plotted. And the question immediately becomes, is this shape variability, the huge shape variability that you see, is it just intrinsic to the system? Is it noise? Or is there some meaning to this? All right. And now, uh, uh, so there was this another study, again, by uh, a bunch of the same authors, in which what they do is something very, very simple. All right. So I'm showing you snapshots of these cells uh, across time. And what you do is you basically uh, color code them, you fit them to uh, shapes, and you basically find the aspect ratios of these cells, all right? And uh, uh, a larger aspect ratio would correspond to something here, and a small aspect ratio something here. And what you find, what you find even evidently in the picture, is that as you go across in time, the cells are becoming, uh, becoming more regular in shape, the aspect ratio is coming down, all right? Now, what they also found is that now you can plot the distribution of the aspect ratios, all right? And what they found is that this is the one for the jam packing, so which is somewhere here. It's, uh, sorry, this is the one for the unjam packings, which is uh, all, these, uh, all these aspect ratio distributions coming from here. And this blue lines are the one for the jam packings. What you find is that this distribution is getting more and more, uh, is getting less and less skewed. All right. And now what you can do is you can, uh, I will not go into the details, you can rescale these distributions in this particular manner. And lo and behold, all of them collapse onto a single universal distribution. All right. And this distribution is called the K gamma distribution. Um, and uh, this has a very interesting outcome. The interesting outcome is that now if you were to look at the standard deviation of the aspect ratio, what I mean by that is now you're looking at the fluctuations of the aspect ratio. It has a very simple linear relationship with the mean aspect ratio, all right? And what I can do now is I can plot the standard deviation of the aspect ratio versus the mean aspect ratio, beautifully collapses onto a line, and it doesn't matter what cell culture you're looking at. It obey, it's, it's true for all the way from cancer cells to uh, uh, canine kidney cells and so on and so forth. It's also been seen for uh, drosophila during uh, embryogenesis and all of that. So this is a pretty universal scaling. And what jamming means is that you're basically moving down this line, all right? Uh, and now, whenever you see this sort of a universal scaling, it basically is telling you that what you're seeing as variability is just not random noise. There is some meaning to it. And uh, so this is all what was known uh, 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 at least a few years ago. And, uh, but then the problem is the following, right? The problem is, the, which, we wish to address in, uh, which we wish to address now, is this jamming and jamming purely cell-shape driven, as the model suggests, right? The answer is not at all obvious. Because in a real cell experiment, you have division, death, and cell size changes, all of which causes changes in density. And you can now have jamming and jamming due to density changes. All right? So uh, and why do we have to bother about such a problem? Uh, it's essentially because of all the examples I've given you that it's essential for many physiological processes, all the way from wound healing to disease progression. So you need to understand this at some level. And uh, what we want to do is to come up with a completely synthetic model all right, which doesn't suffer from all of these difficulties, and then try to address this problem. All right, and the synthetic model that we're going to do is an oversimplification of the real system, uh, but we're going to see if it works. All right, uh, and the ingredients that we're going to have for the synthetic model are just basically two quantities. One is motility. So, for example, these are skin cells moving on a substrate. If you were to stare at these cells, you immediately know that they have some means of self-propulsion inside. So you need some sort of motility. And I'm quantifying that through this parameter called persistence. And the second thing that you need is the fact that the cells are deformable. right? So we're going to use only these two ingredients. We don't even have the terms that we have in the model here. All right? And we're going to see to what extent this minimal uh, representation of uh, epithelial system allows us to uh, capture it, capture what we've seen, all right? 
Uh, so we're going to do experiments now. And the experiments are, so you basically need to have activity or motility coming in. And the standard way to do it is basically uh, in a lab, uh, is you basically have particles. Uh, you, if you have a four aft asymmetry in mass or friction, and if you vibrate the plate, essentially these particles become motile. So we 3D print particles. Uh, so we have these ellipsoidal shapes that we print. We put a hole at the back so that now there is a mass asymmetry. And uh, those are the dimensions of the ellipsoids. And now if you put them on a plate, they basically run around. All right? And one can actually show that the run and tumble dynamics of these particles is very similar to what you would see in E. coli, for instance. All right? But these are still hard particles. Right? So what we're going to do now is to basically take these particles and put them within paper rings. And that's what I meant by an oversimplification of what, I was do what epithelia are. Right? So if I put them inside paper rings, what you find is basically these particles are active. They just go pile up at the boundaries. And, uh, uh, and because they pile up at opposite corners, the cell is not very active. Right? The force is acting on both sides. And uh, the piling up happens simply because of the fact that active particles have what you have. So the fact is that they have persistence, which means they have some sort of an engine inside, which is pushing them in a given direction, which means if they encounter a wall, until the engine decides to reorient its direction, it's going to stay stuck to the wall. And that's precisely what's happening here. right? So you have low net motility if you do this approach. And you also have a non-uniform stiffness, because your particles coating on just one side. Here, the membrane is not of uh, the same stiffness, because the particles are not here. Right? So what you need, essentially, is you need particles to come to the boundary, and then you need to have a torque acting on them so that they basically align parallel to the wall. Right? So, what, so what it means is that we start with this particle, except now we move the hole uh, laterally to the left or the right. And what these particles do is they end up going in circles, because now there is a, a torque and a force acting on these particles. Right? And now what, means, what it means is because there are torques acting, if you take particles which like to take left-handed turns, they will basically embrace a left wall. And if you have particles that take right-handed turn, they'll basically embrace the right wall. All right? uh, so now we can take these particles, put them within membranes, and you see that. Uh, so let me play this video here. So these are all uh, left-rotating particles. And what you basically see is this membrane just rotates because the particles inside are just going around in circles. I don't have control over activity now. Right? So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to have a mixture of left rotating and right rotating particles, which means that if the currents collide, there's going to be a net force acting forward. And if I play this movie to you, you'll immediately see that this cell is running around a lot more than this one. Right? Uh, all of them show now the same time scale, same area, and all of that. Right? But what it means is that I can just play with the number of left and right rotating particles, or essentially the num number of the net chirality of the cell interior. And I can basically control how mobile or how persistent a cell is. Right? And uh, uh, I, I told you I wanted to control persistence. So I have my plot of tau p, which is versus mod chi cell, which is just defined like this. And beautifully, I can control persistence of these cells. All right? Now, the second thing that we didn't expect, but it came along for the ride, was the fact that uh, I can look at the single cell, and I can also now fit the cell to a shape. I can get the aspect ratio of these cells. And now you will see that because all of these particles are exerting torques in the same direction, this cell is more stiff. The standard deviation is smaller. Whereas in this cell, because you have two counterpropagating currents that constantly reorganize, this cell fluctuates a lot more. Right? So what it means is these cells are not only less active, they are more stiff. And these cells are more active and also floppy. Right? Uh, so now we can basically look at the dynamics. Right? And uh, so this is basically my deformable cells on a plate uh, at a very low area fraction. Uh, area fraction is just the area occupied by the cells by the area of the plate. And what you see is that as you increase activity, you basically start seeing these clusters forming of these cells. And these clusters are forming simply because of the fact that they are persistent. Right? Higher the activity, greater the persistent. If you encounter two cells, you're going to stay stuck until you decide to reorient. All right? And this phenomenon is called as motility-induced clustering. But I want you to keep track of the fact that as I increase activity, I'm also getting addition between cells. It is not the addition that you would conventionally think of. It is purely mediated by the sort of non-equilibrium nature of the bath. All right? That's inside. Right? So now what I can do is I can go to the dense limit, which is my interest. Right? So now this is what I'm going to call a confluent monolayer. And this is at a very low activity. That is at a higher activity. And you now see that these cells are deforming and all sorts of stuff is going on. And then uh, here I have stiff cells, there I have floppy cells. But then what's interesting is that when I went to an intermediate activity, the cells are more mobile 
right, than when they had the highest activity. All right. Now the question is, uh, and of course I can uh, overlay the trajectories on these particles, and then what I find is that this system is completely jammed. This system is kind of ergodic, uh, weakly ergodic, and this system is fully ergodic. By that I mean it's sampling all possible configurations available to it. All right. So uh, what I mean is I'm controlling one parameter, but then I'm going from a liquid state, sorry, a solid state to another solid state with an intervening liquid state in between, which is why I'm calling it re-entering jamming. All right. Now what I'm going to do is to quantify this behavior, other than just showing you movies, what I'm going to do is basically quantify the relaxation time. So the relaxation time being larger would mean that the system is jammed. The relaxation time being shorter means it's more fluid-like. All right. So I can get the relaxation uh, time phase diagram. So this is in the confluent limit. And what you see is in this window of densities, if I were to increase my activity, what you find is that you basically go from high relaxation times to low back to high. Right? But this is all nice. The question is, does shape have anything to do with it? All right? So what I can do now is to plot the cell shape and the cell shape variability as I also vary uh, tau p or the activity. And what you find is that right across the band where I see cells are very motile and the system is more fluid-like, that's also I see. That's also when I see that my cells are longer, the aspect ratio is larger, and also they show greater shape variability. All right? So I have the synthetic system that kind of mimics what you would see in the real one. And of course, uh, the reason we see the re-entrant is because of the fact that uh, uh, here you have stiff cells, low motility, and also the addition between cells is small. Here the cells are floppier. They have higher motility, but there's also this addition that comes due to activity, due to very high activity. So they're once again slow here. And in between these two kind of efforts compete. Right? And the reason I have the picture of my student here is that every cell is assembled by hand, put on a plate. So generating this phase diagram is about a year long work, uh, simplified into a slide. Uh, so that's why Pragya is right there. Right? Uh, okay. So now that I've shown you there is some correlation between shape and the dynamics or the fluidity of the cells. Uh, the thing to do is to see if we can mimic the shape variability that was also seen uh, in the experiments, uh, in the real uh, cell layer experiments. So I plot the uh, distribution of the aspect ratios, all right? They all beautifully collapse onto a K gamma distribution. And then this is the picture I showed you earlier. And these are our cells, right lying along the line. All right, so we're basically able to capture this with the oversimplified system, uh, which means that the jamming of a confluent monolayer is indeed shape driven. Our cells don't reproduce, our cells don't die. All right, so we're able to make that very definitive statement. And uh, one thing that I've done so far is that uh, I basically looked at uh, aspect ratios and standard deviations of the entire cells, all the cells on the plate. But then if you go to the videos, you will basically find that. Uh, you'll basically find that there are few cells that are more mobile than the rest of the matrix, all right? And now the question is, is the connection between mobility or the jamness locally and the shape also locally valid? So now we can basically show, uh, we can plot the mobility of just the fast cells and the slow cells. I'm plotting for you the aspect ratio. And for all activities that I have, you basically see that the motility of the, uh, or the aspect ratio of the fast cells is just a bit longer, all right? It's just a bit larger. And uh, interestingly, uh, uh, so this is a recent work in which people looked at uh, breast cancer explants uh, in vitro. And uh, uh, they were able to identify cells that are more motile than the rest of the neighbors. And once again, here you find that these motile cells have a larger aspect ratio, just like we find in this simple experiment. All right. Uh, so the take home is that uh, we have, a, we have a, a synthetic system that allows us to confront uh, some aspects of glassiness seen in the real one. Uh, we have very minimal ingredients, which means that we can now put in more systematically and start uh, coming up with means to confront theory and simulations. Essentially shown that cell shape alone can drive jamming and jamming. And it is not just a marker for global dynamics. It's also a marker for local dynamics because even locally, mobility is associated with uh, 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 shape. And uh, uh, finally, and uh, most importantly, I'd like to thank all my collaborators. This is the work done by Pragya. I really didn't get to talk to you about the simulations work of uh, Sawik and Saroj um, and uh, funding from DSD. Thank you.
that is beautiful. Uh, are, this, are you measuring uh, cell shape in 2D or 3D? Oh, so these are 2D, uh, this is a 2D, yes, we just mentioned the 2D because it's a flat membrane that's been rolled and stuck into... Uh, uh, so in the real world, you have to consider 3D. So if you were to look at so, 3D, so, what would uh, happen? So, so in the vertex model, uh, what you do is you look at cross sections. Uh, so you're still, even if there is a 3D shape change, you're only still sampling the cross section of the cell. And it is a reasonable approximation because what people have done is to image uh, cells from the sides and they show that the height is not fluctuating much, which means whatever shape is changing is entirely in two dimensions. And we do that as well. Just a curiosity question. Is there an effect of the wall? Because the, in your picture, there seems to be a color gradient from center out. Uh, oh. Uh, oh, you mean here? No, no, there. Those pictures all center was darker than Oh, pictures. Oh, that's an imaging artifact. We yeah. correct for it while we process the data. Uh, it's a very large plate, so we don't get to have very uniform illumination. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, if not, let us join, join me in please thanking the dynamic lecture. <laughs>